Thank you. 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 Thank you
Thanks. You. Hi. I was just wondering, out of all the roles you've played, which one do you think you got the most satisfaction out of playing or took the most away from? Well, Roots was um, my first job and, uh, and was incredibly significant culturally. This nation and 50 others around the world were really, mm -hmm. literally transformed by Alex Haley's family story. Star Trek has had an, um, a, an amazing and lasting impact on the culture as well. It's, you know, it's over 50 years old mm -hmm. and still going strong. And I think the, the most important thing I've ever done is reading Rainbow. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Hi, uh, podcasts are my favorite medium, and I really enjoy your new one. Thank you, sir. And I'm interested to know Is how... Is anybody else listening to LeVar Burton Reads? Woohoo! I love you guys. <laughs> <laughs> we got a moment. I would like to know how you feel podcasting for what seems like more ad adults or older people is different from how you approached Reading Rainbow for me personally, one-on-one, -on -one, when I was a kid. Well, um, Reading Rainbow was um, for children, and LeVar Burton Reads is not. <laughs> um, and that's the difference. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the, seriously, the, the whole point behind LeVar Burton Reads is th these past five, six years, while I've been so um, focused on the business of Reading Rainbow, having relaunched the brand in the digital realm, launched it on the iPad. Um, in 2014, we launched the Kickstarter to expand our footprint, to get from the iPad to the Kindle Fire, to Android tablets, to a universal app that you could access on your phones, to the web. Um, and the Kickstarter also made it possible for us to develop a, a product of our digital library, a version of it that teachers could use in the classrooms with lesson plans and the ability to roster 36 to 40 kids and uh, really successfully make reading and then give that product away to 10,000 classrooms in need. Successfully relaunching Reading Rainbow um, into this digital realm for today's digital kids was has been my life these last five or six years. What I looked up and discovered last year was that um, I really needed something creative to do, something solely for the purpose of filling my creative soul. And, um, and that became the podcast, an opportunity for me to go into the studio and read short fiction, stories that I love to read, stories that I would have a good time um, reading out loud, and, and that's, that's the, the genesis behind LBR. Thank you. Thank you. you. And keep listening. Do you have a favorite story so far? Um, the one about the, uh, the hunter, the, the murderer, the alien, the... I don't remember the name. Ken. Yeah. By Bruce McAllister. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the first, that was the first story. Yeah. 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 Yes. Keep listening. Yes. <laughs> what was that again? LeVar Burton Reads. It, it, you can get it wherever you enjoy. Do y'all like podcasts? Yeah? yeah. Okay, all right, good. Yeah. Um, I haven't checked today. Um, when I went to bed last night, not that I check often, um, we were number one in the arts category and, uh, and number six overall. Killing Kickstarters and podcasts. As best as we are able. Go ahead. Hey, how you doing? Uh, question, what is You have triples on your I, shoulder. I know. I, I had one yesterday, and I put him in my bag last night. He got I, to the snacks, and I, I got I figured it wasn't on. news at all to you. I just thought I'd yeah. share. Question for you. For those of us that are not familiar with Hollywood and the things, what's it, what is an average day like for an actor like you for doing Star Trek? What time do you get up in the morning? How late do you work? Do you get home at five o'clock in the afternoon? Do you come home at two o'clock in the morning? What's, it, what's an average day like for you? Average day is um, about a 12 hour day um, from, you know, from call to wrap. Um, that's, 
Yeah, that's, a, that's pretty normal. You put in 12-hour days, five days a week. Um, during Star Trek, we did 26 episodes a season, which meant we, we did that schedule um, of five days a week, 12 hours a day for 10 months of the year. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, hey, Tribble Guy. This is for you, but remember, do not feed it to the Tribbles. <laughs> yes, sir, okay. We all know what happens. Hi. It's Quattro um, Triticale. That does that. <laughs> yes. Tribbles. I'm not, I'm not sure Tootsie Rolls have any Quattro Triticale in them. Well, <laughs> you feed it, tri- you stop feeding them, stop feeding them. I could be wrong. <laughs> Hi. This is another visor question. Another visor question. Yes. Um, I'm sure. It, from what I've read as an actor, your eyes are very important. Yes, to, and to actors and other living beings. Yes, yeah. but I mean, <laughs> I mean for the emotion and, and, and while you're acting. Yes. So ha- when you first got the character and you knew you weren't, wouldn't be able to use your eyes, yes. it must have been sort of, I don't know, upsetting, or did you have to consider what, how you would do it? Because your character was so, he did come out so real. Um, how to make that happen without having your eyes. The upsetting part uh, came much later. Um, initially, it was nothing but excitement. <laughs> it, well, it took a moment for the penny to drop, and then I realized, shit. <laughs> My eyes are going to be covered for the next seven freaking years. <laughs> this really sucks. <laughs> Then I went through the different stages of anger, <laughs> rage, <laughs> depression, as one might expect, <laughs> to acceptance, and finally, ocular implants. <laughs> Whatever you did, he. Jordy came across as such a real character. I mean, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. You. Oh, look at you, Guinan. Hi. Hi, you look so lovely. Give Guinan a hand, y'all. LaVar, my question for you is, you worked with so many black uh, stars and Whoopi Goldberg was one of my favorites, of course, and I'd like to know what it was like working for her, working with her behind the scenes, because both of you were so serious in your characters, but I know both of you have a wonderful sense of humor, so what was it like behind the scenes with between you and, and Whoopi Goldberg? I love, I love my sister Whoopi, um, <laughs> and working with her uh, is, as you might imagine, a real joy. Uh, she is one of the most well-read human beings I have ever encountered. And of course, she's one of the funniest. Um, so any opportunity to be in the presence of Whoopi is an opportunity that, it, that enriches your soul. Yes, thank you so much. You're so welcome. Okay. Oh, oh Guinan, you get two. <laughs> thank you. So I went to a two-part question. What was the f- your favorite book that you read on Reading Rainbow? And um, what was your favorite storyline for Jordy? Favorite book from Reading Rainbow? Boy, there are so many. Um, but two stand out. Um, well, no. Uh, that's, there's, gosh, there's so many. Um, I'll mention two. Enemy Pie by Derek Munson. Um, one of my favorite stories. And Amazing Grace by Mary Hoffman, which is an episode of Reading Rainbow that featured the very lovely Whoopi Goldberg. Cool. What was your favorite storyline for Jordy? The favorite storyline, my favorite storyline from Jordy, um, oh, was when Jordy had sex with a woman. Oh, <laughs> wait. I'm sorry, that didn't actually happen, did it? <laughs> Crap, I forgot. We were rooting for you. <laughs> Not hard enough. <laughs> Touche. Yes, hey, lady. Hello. Uh, as a fellow bibliophile, I'd like to know what your favorite book is, if you have one. My favorite book tends to be whatever book I'm reading at the time, in the moment, right now. I mean, I'm always reading science fiction. What um, are you reading? 
Say again? What are you reading right now? Um, I've got a library on my iPad. I, I, genu- I mean, I literally have a library um, on my iPad. And to me, that is an absolute miracle of the modern age. Um, I carry around literally thousands of books. And, um, and it adds no weight at all to my backpack. <laughs> is, is, Isn't technology a wonderful it's, thing? It's just amazing. But I've always, like I said, I've always got some science fiction going. Um, uh, there is a, a compendium every year. Uh, the best, it's an anthology of the best short fictions. I love short stories. That's why I'm reading short stories on LeVar Burton Reads. Um, there's a, a compendium edited by Gardner Dozois uh, called uh, The Best in Science Fiction, Short Fiction, and then The Year After It. Um, that's always in rotation. Um, what else? Uh, People's History of the United States, Howard Zinn. Um, like my mom, I generally, you know, I'm, I'm reading a couple of books at the same time. I just got gifted Ready Player One, so that's... That's in rotation and at the top of my list. So my reading habits are pretty eclectic, but when I'm reading purely for pleasure, it's generally sci-fi. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, when I was growing up, not only did my dad watch Star Trek with us, but also part of the daily lineup for my educational shows was always reading Rainbow. And I was wondering if there was any books that you read to Mika as she was growing up or any books that she might have requested if she was around at the time? Um, My wife and I read a lot to and with Mika. Um, uh, When Mika was in utero, we read uh, to each other, Stephanie and I, a John Irving novel, and I just blanked on the name, Um, uh, Owen, Owen, A Prayer for Owen Meany, A Prayer for Owen Meany. Um, that was while Mika was in the womb. Um, Stephanie took uh, the Lemony Snicket series, and I got Harry Potter, hey. uh, <laughs> which was great until Harry Potter got real scary, and uh, <laughs> and Mika started freaking out. So we had to we had to pump the brakes on that one. Um, I'm so grateful that my kid has turned out to be the voracious reader that she has. Um, It works. If you read not just to your kids, but in front of your kids, if you give them that very important modeling that reading is a normal, everyday activity that we do as human beings, they'll get the message. Okay, thank you. Trust and believe. You. You bet. Hi. Hi. I just wanted to say that growing up as a kid, my parents worked all the time, so really didn't have that much interaction until they came back home tired. Um, my babysitter put on your show growing up, and I want to say that was the preface to my passion to reading, and it really got me into it, the summer library programs and the reading program, so thank you for that. Um, with that said, my question is this. Looking back at your achievement, your career, from hindsight, is there anything you would say to your younger self, an encouragement, or something that you would have wished you would have been, uh, thought of back then? I, I, would, I would tell my 19-year-old self, Relax and breathe. It's all going to be all right. Awesome. Roots was, was my first job. It was my first professional audition. So imagine at the age of 19 thinking, wow, I, I just peaked. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I really had to, to integrate the prospect that I would never do anything as important as that or as big as that or as successful as that. And I had to make peace with that at the age of 19. So I would tell that 19-year-old kid, you know, it is an appropriate response to be full of anxiety, but it's going to be all right. Thank you. Yeah, ma'am. Thank you. Hello again. Hello again. Thank you, um, for, thank you for going back to the end of the line. I appreciate that. She obeyed the rules. I'm a Starfleet officer. I love that about you. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> It's fun, isn't it? Yeah. (laughs) Um, A lot of the Star Trek family uh, started directing while they were on the show. Yourself, Frakes, McNeil, Dawson. What was the environment like that fostered that? Uh, Do you guys, those of you who went from acting to directing, do you get together? 
did you confab? What was the environment like for that? It was, it was incredibly supportive. Rick Berman, Rick Berman, Rick Berman, the executive producer, was responsible for that happening. And of course, Jonathan was the first to set the template. Um, and w w when you went to Rick, if you went to Rick and said you expressed a desire to direct, um, he would send you to school, what we can lovingly refer to as Star Trek University. And you would spend weeks immersing yourself in the, in the process, sitting with every editor in the rotation, coming in on your days off, going to production meetings and scoring sessions and spotting sessions. And you would just, you were, you were required to get a complete and comprehensive education of the process of filmmaking, storytelling on film. And then you, you got a slot. And whether you got a second slot. Did you, do you guys get together, those of you that made the switch, do you get together at all? No. <laughs> Thank you. No, and in case you hadn't heard, Hollywood is a very cutthroat environment. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Hi. As, as a Starfleet engineer, you use that techno babble so well. So did you feel silly about it though? Did Say you again? ever feel silly about those techno babbles that you did? It was very effective. Yes, the, the, the techno babble, um, the writers wrote it very well. Yeah. Um, I, I understood very little of it. <laughs> so I, I had a technique as an actor, which was to spit it out as fast as I possibly could, giving the illusion that I knew what I was talking about. And, and it seemed to work. Yeah, it did, of course. <laughs> it did work. You, you bought it? <laughs> I knew it was. Well, it's a testament to you and your castmates because some actors could not pick it up. You know, Star Trek is, is, is much more a stylized brand of acting than you might think. There are a lot of guest stars who came in and just had a real difficult time. First of all, there was no ad-libbing on, on Star Trek. Mm -hmm. you, you had to be letter perfect. Those were the rules. Um, it's not like any of us could ad-lib the science and tech anyway. Yeah. Um, even if we knew what we were talking about, which we didn't. Um, but the, the, the delivery of a lot of that technical jargon requires a facility um, with language that not everybody brought to the table. Yeah, you were very good. Thank you. Thank you. Are you an engineer? No, I'm a physicist. You're a physicist. Oh, well, <laughs> well phys right. physicist, physicist, I'll get that. Are you an engineer? No, I'm smarter than an engineer. <laughs> I'm a physicist, <laughs> dummy. <laughs> hey, boss. Uh, hey, thanks for being here. Uh, third grade teacher, and on behalf thank of you. all of us, thank you so much for reading. Thank right you. Now. Thank you, boss. Just fabulous. So, uh, we really, the role model that you presented was just priceless, so thank you. Um, my question today is uh, Broadway. If you ever thought of Broadway or constantly, maybe... all right. And can you just tell us a little bit about if you? It is one of my as yet unfulfilled um, dreams. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Could you uh, like? Do you have, would you like write a play or you? Would I write a play or just? On stage? I'm, I'm having a difficult time of getting cast in one. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. My question is sort of a follow up to his. Do you think being um, Jordy LaForge limited the jobs you could get because you got typecast? You know what? If, if, if it did, and it, and it may have, I, I don't give that um, a whole lot. I don't allow for it to occupy a lot of space in consciousness because I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade the Star Trek experience for, for the world. Thank you. Um, please forgive me if I'm wrong, the whole audience and you, but didn't you guest star in a house episode? With Hugh Laurie? No? 
No, okay. <laughs> like, I, I could have sworn. And you're forgiven. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Double check that IMBD. <laughs> Well, sometimes it's wrong. Sometimes it can be wrong. No Tootsie Roll for you. <laughs> we got rules. Hi, I've been really loving LeVar Burton Reads. Are there any authors or specific short stories that you are either looking forward to doing on that podcast or that you want to do in the future but don't haven't made any meetings. We are in conversations right now um, with the estate of Octavia Butler <gasps> to, uh, to, to do one of her short stories, um, which I'm so excited about. I've already recorded it, and we're just we're putting the final touches on agreements. Um, the story that I, that just landed in my inbox to preview for Tuesday's release is a story I'm really excited about by Haruki Murakami. Any Murakami fans in the house? Um, so yeah, and I th think, I'm not sure if I can talk about this, um, but I will anyway. Uh, <laughs> um, we may end season one with an Elmore Leonard. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, did you, have you read the Neil Gaiman? Neil Gaiman is the episode that dropped on Tuesday oh, called Chivalry. Good. You missed that one. Run, run! <laughs> Damn you! It's, it's Neil Gaiman! It's Neil Gaiman! Hi again. So uh, I am a pediatric optometrist, and I am constantly battling encouraging children to read and discouraging screen time and indoor time because there's a huge increase in the amount of nearsightedness and other visual problems that children are undergoing. So I'm curious if you've given much thought to that balance. Yeah, balance is the, is the real key. Um, look, the, the, um, the Society of Pediatrics released a, uh, the results of a study a few weeks back, maybe a few months back now, um, talking about how important it is to limit screen time for a certain age group of children, and I completely and totally agree with that. We need to have we just have to use the good sense God gave us, right? Um, having said that, I really don't care if you're reading on a tablet device or in a bound book. I simply want folks to read. But there is such a thing as, as age-appropriate screen time and, and our need and necessity to limit that. You see, you, you, just, you see it showing up in your practice, an increase of nearsightedness because kids are straining their eyes, um, focused for too long a, a period of time on the screen. Not, it indicates a lack of balance, right? Absolutely. Yeah, balance. Can I have a tattoo roll? <laughs> Throw it from here, see if you can see it. <laughs> All right, yeah, Mets kid, you get one too for being a nice guy. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, I know, that, um, well, obviously now we see that like Roots was such a big impact, really influential to like the entire world. But when you were auditioning for it and filming it, did you have any idea of how big it would become and how important it would be? No, not at all. No, nobody did, not even the network. The reason Roots, the original Roots aired in eight consecutive nights of television, setting records, some of which stand to this day, is because, they, I mean, they, they, they loved the show, but they didn't know how it was going to play in Peoria, as they say. So they decided to air it in consecutive installments. The miniseries that had aired previous to Roots were done in weekly installments. The ABC executives were nervous about stretching it out for weeks at a time, so they decided to air it in eight consecutive nights. Um, turned out to be a good thing. The final episode of Roots on Night 8 is still one of the most watched episodes of television in the history of the medium. And then how did you hear about it, too, before you auditioned? Um, they were beating the bushes, um, casting-wise. They had been to New York and Chicago and L.A. and had seen every young black actor who had an agent and had any connection to the business. I was a drama student 
studying theater at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. They called the drama schools at UCLA, CalArts, and SC where I was. I was one of three, three black men in the drama school at SC. Went on a go see. Technical showbiz term meaning go to this address and see the people who are there. And uh, the people who were there turned out to be the legendary Lynn Stallmaster, casting director, um, who cast Roots. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Simpson. Uh, we met Simpson. earlier. Simpson's wearing a Captain Planet t-shirt. Anybody a Captain Planet fan in the house? I think you got a few. Let our powers combine. Earth! <laughs> Yeah, that's a part of the reason I'm here. Uh, like uh, a lot of people here, I also want to say thank you for reading Rainbow. Uh, I mean, I've been in love with books for such a long time, and I really love that show. Um, but like you just mentioned, this Captain Planet shirt, um, my main question was, how did you get that role, and what was that process like for you for doing um, animation? I love doing animation. The process uh, of auditioning was really a, a simple one. They were looking for a West African accent. I gave them my best shit. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Captain Planet. You get one for Captain Planet. All right. I got a bar, Victor, from uh, big fan, longtime fan. I got two questions for you. The first one has to be with uh, character development in Next Generation. Um, do you feel that Leah Brahms, that love interest, was never developed fully? I know that in one of the... <laughs> As a character, as you as a character playing that role, do you feel that you were shortchanged, that there wasn't any bigger love interest there? And the uh, second question has to do with uh, Kate Mulgrew. Have you worked with her or, or thought of working with her off Broadway? Well, uh, I'll take the first question first. <laughs> we have a small line, otherwise I would have cut you off. Um, I thought things were working out really well until the real Leah Brahms busted Jordy on the holodeck, <laughs> messing around with a holodeck Leah Brahms. <laughs> and can you blame her? I mean, that's pretty creepy, stalkerish behavior. <laughs> when you think about it. Um, Kate McGrew, interestingly enough, uh, we did a, um, a TV movie hiatus between seasons one and two of Next Generation. It was a TV movie where Lou Gossett and I reprised our Kunta and Fiddler roles from Roots. And in this one movie of the week, a Christmas movie called Roots the Gift, um, are Tim Russ, Kate Mulgrew, and Avery Brooks, along with LeVar Burton. That's crazy, right? All in one TV movie. But no, no, I know that she goes off Broadway. She's done, worked in Broadway. She's very heavy into that. Yeah. Same thing with, um, uh, in London, obviously, poor John Luke Picard, who's now on a TV show, but he was heavy into Broadway, and I know that's one of your aspirations. Uh-huh. So there's no interest in collaboration or anything? You mean? With actual Kate McGraw producing something. With Kate McGraw? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I got a friend that does Broadway once in a while named Patrick Stewart. I know, but, but he's locked in a TV show now, so it's a little harder for him and to... Is unless he? Unless you're going to go... What? what TV show is he locked into? Well, it was on uh, Showtime. On Showtime. Blunt Talk? Yes. Blunt Talk was canceled. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> Acting is complex. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, hi, good morning, and good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here today and giving your time. I just wanted to ask if you could speak a little bit about when Reading Rainbow just first got started and started to pick up popularity, did you know what it was going to turn into and was going to be the juggernaut that it's come to be? No, we had no idea. No, my, my career has been a, a series of, of um, <sighs> happy accidents. I guess is the best way to phrase it. Um, when Reading Rainbow was created, it was during a time in an American education and the evolution of American education and the evolution of the medium of television where the conversation in, in educational circles was mostly around 
the danger that television presented to our children where their education is concerned. It was a fairly counterintuitive idea to actually utilize the engagement factor of television mm -hmm. to promote books and literature, especially to kids, um, during the summer months, which is when we knew there was an, an extremely high concentration of kids gathered around TV sets. Um, and in the beginning, um, it was very, very difficult to get people to cooperate, um, authors, publishers, uh, illustrators. It took a couple of years, and then we began to sort of build up a head of steam. When we re reached critical mass, I think in season three or four, um, we could tell that there was a sea change in the attitudes. Publishers were then beginning to come to us. They noticed that the books that were being featured on the show were flying off the shelves. Um, we were really beginning to have an impact, and through the research that we were, were doing, we were able to track the increase in reading and comprehension skills among kids who were engaged with the show over the summer vacation. The show was actually created to address what teachers call the summer slide or the summer loss phenomenon when a child is learning how to read and they don't read over that three month summer break, their, their comprehension skills tend to plummet. We were just making sure that they were reading over that summer break and it had, it made such a difference. The unexpected, unintended outcome was creating two generations of voracious readers, human beings who love the written word that we didn't see coming. Well, thank you for it, because I was one of those kids in the summertime watching it, so I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, so very quickly, I just want to say thank you for reading Rainbow as well. Um, my parents immigrated here in the 80s, so from, while they were learning how to speak English, oh, from Haiti. From Haiti. So when they were learning how to speak English, reading Rainbow was something that we used as a family. Help us, so thank you for that. My question is, similar to what someone touched on earlier, Broadway, you never got to do that. Are there any other things in your career that you haven't done yet that you still aspire to do at this point? Um, aside from Broadway? Um, well, I, 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 I still love directing. I, um, I'm, I'm actively um, on a show called NCIS New Orleans. Oh, um, yes! Love that yeah. show. Thank you. Um, and I, I go back to New Orleans in September uh, to direct another episode of that show. I love that show. And, and my old friend Scott Bakula is number one on the call sheet there, so it's always fun to, to be with him and, and be around him. Um, I've got a couple of feature films um, in development. Um, I, at this point in my life, I just want to be able to tell stories that move me. And I want to tell them to a variety of audiences, children, teens, and, and adults alike. Thank you. Honor. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Since there was no internet back then, and the opening credits, when an episode would say, directed by LeVar Burton, mm -hmm. directed by Patrick Stewart, that was always a head turner. That always made everybody go, whoa, whoa, whoa they directed this episode, mm -hmm. wow. Mm -hmm. It's like, how did that come around? Did, uh, did you ask, hey guys, what do I, how can I direct an episode of Next Gen? Yeah, well, the, Jonathan was the first. Yeah. Yeah, he asked, and, and then everybody else followed suit. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, Star Trek U has turned out some really pretty good directors. Absolutely. Over time, mm -hmm. some pretty good ones. Go ahead. Hi. Um, through your career, you've had the opportunity to help and inspire and impact so many people. Have you always had a passion for that? And was there a moment that really gave you that passion? Well, my passion for the written word comes straight up from my mom, Irma Jean. Whenever I, I have the opportunity to speak my mom's name in public, I do Irma Jean Christian. That is my mother's name. I love that woman. Um, the Roots experience was one that really taught me about the power of the medium. Um, in eight consecutive nights of television, I observed how our nation, and as I said earlier, 50 some other countries around the world were transformed um, by the power of storytelling. And when the idea for Reading Rainbow was presented to me, that just, it made a whole lot of sense that we could use this very powerful medium as a social tool for social change. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 
Good afternoon. I just wanted to uh, thank you for inspiring me to be a lifelong reader, um, especially those of us who didn't have, as so many others have said, that example growing up. You know, you have been a, a huge inspiration. But my question is um, about remakes, and um, I've seen we, we, uh, many of us have seen the remakes of remake of Roots, and I know you had a small cameo in that. And I was wondering what your view viewpoint is on the remake of Roots and remakes in general. Well, I didn't only have a small cameo in Roots. I was the executive producer. Correct. Yes. So, um, <laughs> oops. <laughs> so there's that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I am uh, deeply I embarrassed. I am being spoken today. Which, which, is to, which is to say, I'm really proud of, the, of, of what we did and, and the storytelling. We remade Roots, and I was not a, 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 in favor of remaking it in the very beginning, um, until it was explained to me by my co-executive producer, Mark Wolper, the son of David L. Wolper, the man who produced the original miniseries Roots. Mark had tried to show the original Roots to his kids, and they were teenagers. I think his son was about 16 at the time, and they watched, but Mark related, recounted to me that it was a pretty painful experience for him because they were very critical of it. They, they hardly sat still, but you know, being dutiful children, they watched. At the end of the, the experience, Mark's son said to him, Dad, I, I get it. I, I understand why Roots is important, but it's kind of like your music. It doesn't speak to me. And when Mark shared that story with me, I realized that it was necessary for me to, to get over myself because if we were ever going to keep this story alive, in culture, then we had to make a version that spoke to this current generation with stars that they recognized, like with Lawrence Fishburne and Forrest Whitaker and Anna Paquin, you know what I'm saying? We need, we definitely need to keep this aspect of our American story alive. Obviously, if we don't, we will get more of what we are experiencing in this now moment in American politics and discourse. And so I'm really proud of the fact that we successfully retold this story for a, a, a new generation. Uh, thank you very much for yeah. all the important work you've done. Uh, thank Appreciate you. It. Thank you. Thank you. So I can't believe you haven't gotten a question on the show Perception yet. Um, how much fun is it to work with Eric McCormack? Eric McCormack is like the most fun person to work with on the planet. Excellent. I, no, I mean that. <laughs> I, lo I love that man. He's so smart, so funny, so giving, and I, I mourn the loss of perception. Personally, I, I thought, oh, man, this is going to go on forever. This is just great. And we ended up doing what? Three, three seasons, I think, is all? Yeah. Yeah, that made me sad. Yeah, I work in healthcare, and I've had to deal with a lot of academic and intelligent you know, people no, with I did behavior. this uh, perception, for those of you who don't know, was a TNT series I did with Eric McCormack from Will & Grace. Will & Grace is coming back to the NBC this year, y'all. Yep. Very excited about that. Eric played a, a neuroscientist um, who was schizophrenic and helped the FBI solve crimes, as one would. And... <laughs> <laughs> and I played uh, the dean of the college where he taught, uh, taught and, and his best friend. I, I, I just, the chemistry that I had with Eric was, um, was immediate, and I miss it. Well, I related to the character because it had to deal with a lot of surgeons and yep. who, who have all these errant behaviors, yep. and you got to keep them in line, yet they're completely out of control. Yep. All right, appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hello, assalamu alaikum. Uh, the, my name's Fouad, I'm an ethnic actor in South Florida. Uh, my question is basically is how do we elevate the, the discussion of race or in media and what are you seeing in Hollywood? I mean, you're at Kunta Kinte, and we went from Kunta Kinte to Django Unchained, the Obama presidency. I can't help but think when you're on stage of, of Cosby and the tearing down of Cosby and what he meant to me growing up what Keith Hutzable meant to me, and what Jordy LaForge meant to me, and what Reading Rainbow meant to me. And we're in this post-Obama world, like you discussed in the Huffington Post article last year. Um, but you're one of those friendly black faces. You know, you, Wayne Brady, Cosby, 
Um, is there still, is Hollywood, how does Hollywood treat that friendly black face? And is there a voice for an angry uh, black face in the midst of the Black Lives Matter movement, all this stuff going on? How do we elevate this discussion? And how do you see Hollywood interacting with you and with black people? You want LeVar to smack a bitch? Is that what you're saying? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, first of all, let me say, I, I, I think the situation that Mr. Cosby finds himself in is one of his own making. Yes. I don't think anybody's done anything necessarily yes. to tear him down. Yes. Uh, he's done a pretty successful job of that himself. Yes. Um, and yet what, what that character meant, though, yeah. that's what I'm, it's yeah. affecting me. I'm, I, I, I'm, I mourn what we lost as well. Yeah. I mourn that as well. But we still have you. Yeah, but see, here's the thing. And I learned this from Gene Roddenberry, who was one of my storytelling, storytelling mentors. Um, I've been really, really fortunate in my life to have had the opportunity to work and study under three giants in the storytelling profession. Alex Haley, Gene Roddenberry, and Fred Rogers, mm. Mr. Rogers. Gene, one of the things that I learned from Gene in that I was such a fan and, and held him in such reverence that once I got to know him, I really began to see and be conflicted about how human he was. Right? He was this great visionary, and yet on closer inspection, all of the women in Star Trek always wore short skirts. Mm. What's up with that? Mm. Right? Um, Gene came from a, a time period and a culture where you imbibed your lunch. Mm. Right? Of three, four, five martinis. And what I, one of the things that I learned from Gene is just how dangerous it is to put your heroes on a pedestal because the only trajectory that they can enjoy from the height of a pedestal is a downward one. Yeah. All of our heroes are human. Yeah. You feel me? Yeah. I don't want to be put on a pedestal. Right. I really don't because that means that there's only one Unless I sprout some rings, <laughs> there's only one way for me to go. So how do we elevate it without a pedestal? How do we... Elevate it without a pedestal. How do we elevate without a pedestal? That's, that is... That's for you to figure that's, out. That, that is a dilemma for you to decipher. Thank you. Yeah, man. Thank you. Unfortunately, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, we have hit our time. I do apologize. Catch up at his table if you have something like that. Come on by, say hi. I'm LeVar Burton. I thank you for your time, your energy, and attention. I'll see you next time, but you don't have to take my word for it.